You know, adult graphic novels uh, go far beyond the comic books of yesteryears with remarkable illustration. They have clear and compelling storylines, but you know, there's also an underlying social commentary. The Surrogates by Robert Venditti has garnered numerous awards and will be released as a, in the theaters as a feature film this fall, starring Bruce Willis. Please welcome, if you would, Robert Venditti. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming me. in. Um, some people would think of a comic book and a graphic novel perhaps is the same thing. Are they the same or is there a difference? They're same in their storytelling format, you know, where you have the word balloons and the, the sequential art leading you through a story and things like that. Mm -hmm. But really, it's, it's all over the spectrum as far as content and, yeah. and all those kinds of things. I think people traditionally would probably associate, you know, comics with uh, a younger audience, but it's much more of a grown-up medium now. And um, really when they say like graphic novels a format, it could be one of two things. It could be a collection of individual comics collected into a, a spined out format that would go on your bookshelf. Okay. Or it can be something that is, you know, a single work written like a novel mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, for example, Blankets, which is 692 pages. You know, it's just a single work that was drawn over a span of years and, and you know, compiled into this tome yeah. that was released in one time. So. That's because that's a big comic book. Very big. Yeah, yeah. that's not something <laughs> you put in your backpack. The idea of, um, of who, who would be the consumer, because there's, there's a market, a, a clear market for this sort of uh, product out there. Is there a person that's drawn to this? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it really, that the idea would be, is it simply a person that doesn't like to read? that only wants to look at pictures, what pulls a person into this? Um, I, I think uh, it's a lot of things, you know. Uh, you know, this generation, you know, for, well, for a few generations now, we've grown up more of a visual medium with mm -hmm. television and film and things like that. And so I think that makes graphic novels an attractive uh, format. But they're very much a genre uh, or a literary medium actually separate from others. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing, you know, I'm a big novel reader myself, you yeah. know, I read a lot of nonfiction and things like that. So there's nothing that would keep you from crossing over between the two. And, you know, audience wise, you know, there's everything from all ages, you know, all the way up to, you know, grown up literary mm -hmm. style novels. So um, there's really out there, you know, something for everybody and every reader. Now, did you come into the idea of writing uh, graphic novels as a, as an illustrator? Was it, was it the illustration that drew you into it or was it the storytelling? Yeah, actually, I didn't grow up reading comic books, you know. Yeah. Um, I tried to be an artist when I was a kid. I wanted to be like an animator. I wanted to do like Bugs Bunny cartoons. Uh -huh. That was my dream. But I realized very early on, you know, after having studied the books, that I just didn't have the knack for it. And so I think I turned to writing um, because I was able to describe, you know, in words what I couldn't draw with my hand. And so, you know, all my schooling and all of my life, my intention was to be a prose writer and to mm -hmm. write novels and short fiction and things like that. But uh, in about 2000, I read my first comic book and it, it just sort of hit me, never having read them before, that this would be the perfect marriage of the two things for me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I could do the writing and then have somebody take the words and translate them into the art that mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to do myself. And so that's what, you know, immediately jumped out at me. Do you see the progression of the story in your head with the characters? And do you see it, it graphically and then just describe that in the, in the, in the content? Um, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I don't know, it may work different for other people. Mm -hmm. And there are some artists that write themselves. So, yeah. that, you know, they do everything in one deal. So they're, they're probably a little bit different. But I do visualize every panel and try to describe it, you know, to the mm -hmm. best of my ability. But you also want to give the artist who's translating that the freedom to do their own thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm good with words, but maybe not so much with the visual aspect. Mm -hmm. And so you want to give the artist, where that's really his forte, the ability to change angles or do these kinds mm -hmm. of things to really you know, heighten the drama of the sequence. Well, let's get right to it. The surrogates. What is the storyline? How would you describe that in the summary form? Uh, it's, it's a sci-fi detective story uh, set in the future, but it, it's a world very much like our own, except you've just had this technology called a surrogate mm -hmm. uh, introduced. And what a surrogate is, it's basically sort of an android representation of yourself that looks like a real person. And it goes out into the world and you're linked to it virtually. So you experience everything it's doing in real time and you control all of its actions through thought in real time, um, but you're not present. So you know, you can have them for any kind of reasons. Maybe you just want to look different or, uh, you know, maybe a uh, fireman might have one so they have to worry about the hazards of their job. Or maybe you're diabetic and you just want to eat chocolate or whatever. You can sort of do anything with your mm -hmm. surrogate and uh, experience all those kinds of things. Well, because you described that, um, and I think people have an idea what you're talking about, but uh, as I read it, it's clear this, this surrogate, this is not a robot in the sense that it operates uh, autonomously necessary. It allows you to sit in a chair and then to go to work or go to 
the mall or to do anything and actually experience being there and to eat food and the surrogate actually brings it, takes it all into a, a, a container, so to speak, and, and, and it's as if you actually were there. Yeah, it, it's living your life for you, um, and, but you're experiencing it as, as it does that. And Without the consequences. Exactly, yeah. And I, basically, you know, I, I grew up in this sort of internet culture and these kinds of things that started, you know, is so prevalent now with online gaming and chatting mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. And it just always struck me, this sort of, you know, basic human need that mm -hmm. people seem to have to want to be something other than the, themselves. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they'll turn to the computer to do that and they'll just sort of, sort of become so involved in that. Yeah. But at some point you have to give this persona you create online, you have to surrender that so that you can take the kids to school or go to the grocery store or the mall or whatever have you. And so I just thought, what would the world be like if you could create this persona and it could do all those things for mm -hmm. you and we could all sort of live as these idealized versions of ourselves? Have you just, have you taken kind of like that idea of the website Second Life where people go in and actually they abandon the first life and, and live as if they're living that second life out? Have you taken that into uh, to a situation like technology where it could actually happen in real life? Is, is that a similar? Yeah, I, I wrote the story in 2002, and I don't know if um, oh. if Second Life was around then. If it yeah. was, I hadn't heard of it. Yeah. Um, but you know, gaming similar. and things was a big part of it, and also at the same time, there were a lot of TV shows on, like Extreme Makeover, and all these kinds of mm -hmm. things, where you know a lot of this uh, you know heavily plastic surgery type thing, and so um, <laughs> it was those kinds of things that were sort of stewing around in my yeah. brain. But yeah, Second Life very much mm -hmm. seems to be you know, I mean, there's there's actual companies that have virtual storefronts in Second Life and do business and, and these kinds of things. So um, it, it doesn't seem, I guess, as far-fetched as it yeah. did when I first wrote it. And before we get into some of the questions that you just raised, because the idea, what, what, the, what are the consequences of that? Um, let's talk for a minute about what I found to be very unique in the reading of your book, which is it read like a graphic novel, but every, every so often you drop in a lot of text or a, like a manual or a, uh, um, a, 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 a description of something. I, we can see them on the screen right now. That is completely different. That's juxtaposed pretty much to a comic book. What was the inspiration behind that insert? I just, um, you know, having a background in prose, you know, I was, wasn't unfamiliar with, mm -hmm. you know, uh, s standard writing. And it was just something where I, the idea that I had was basically, I thought, a five-act, you know, detective story. But I had a lot more information I felt like I had to convey to really let the reader understand what this future world was like. Mm -hmm. And so that supplemental material was a way to do that, you know, to write these, you know, uh, fake, you know, scholarly articles about how surrogate technology has impacted, you know, uh, law enforcement yeah. or, you know, public health or things like that. You know, rather than try to bog all that stuff down in dialogue where you, where you get the feeling that the characters are just talking to each other, I felt these text pieces would be a better way, mm -hmm. you know, to go ahead and achieve that. And, and the action takes place most of it in 2054. Correct, yes. And, uh, and it refers back to documents leading up to the creation of these surrogates. You know, it's interesting. Um, it seems as though that out of, a, out of crisis many times, an idea springs up, and it seems good, and then there's this unintended consequence. You look at uh, September 2001. Sure. Crisis, clearly, with the, the attack, followed up by an idea of let's go on the offensive, some people say the unintended consequences is overreaching, perhaps. So you look at the financial crisis. And uh, the idea is let's get involved and help, the government says. Unintended consequences could be causing a depression rather than stopping it. You had a crisis, it seemed like, in the book that, that happened, an explosion, an event that almost created the need for how can we do this better hence the surrogates. Do you see that connection? Yeah, definitely. And, and the thing about technology as well is it, it moves forward at such an exponential rate, mm -hmm. you know, and, and even in moments of not crisis, technology is just barreling forward. And, uh, you know, it's building upon itself and yeah. moving so rapidly that I don't think that we understand the ramifications of the technology that we're enacting today and what that's going to do down the road because before that technology is even on the market, we're already a step ahead of that yes. almost. So, um, you know, that was very much uh, a part of what I was thinking when I 